Story no one. In a remote corner of the world, there's a camping spot that's been our family's secret for generations. I first visited this place when I was just a baby, and now, at 40, it's still part of my life. It's a peaceful spot, located near a tiny mountain town with less than 30 people. Despite the world growing more crowded, this place remains our solitary retreat. One of my earliest camping memories, though not my own, still chills me. I was about two years old, too young to remember. My mom and I were there, just the two of us. I was playing by the riverbank, lost in a child's innocent world. Suddenly, a car arrived. Two men inside, they just sat there, the car idling, watching us. My mom, sensing something wasn't right, grabbed her handgun and stood watch, her eyes darting between me and the strangers. The men eventually approached, casually asking about the fishing. Their eyes, though, were asking if we were alone. My mom cleverly didn't tell them we were by ourselves. After a bit, they left. But the unease hung in the air, thick as fog. That night, as darkness swallowed the world outside our tent, we heard a car. It sounded like the same one from earlier. The car would stop, idle, then creep forward, not on the road but through the trees, like some lurking predator. It was a terrifying game of stop and go, the headlights occasionally piercing the tent's fabric, casting eerie shadows around us. I slept through it all, unaware, but my mom was wide awake, dressed, boots on, gun in hand, ready for anything. The car continued this strange dance for over an hour. Then, as suddenly as it had come, it left, maneuvering clumsily before disappearing. Mom stayed up all night, watching, waiting. They didn't come back. As soon as the first light of dawn crept in, we packed up and left. That experience, though I don't remember it myself, has always stayed with me, a reminder of the unknown dangers that can lurk in even the most familiar places. Story No. 2 In the year 1993, during the restless times of high school, a group of us, about 15 in total, decided to escape the mundane for a weekend of camping and dirt biking in the hills northeast of Yuba City, California. What unfolded was a tale so bizarre it still sends shivers down my spine. Our adventure began innocently enough with the thrill of freedom and the roar of motorcycle engines echoing through the hills. But as night descended, so did an air of unease, heralded by the arrival of some unsavory characters, local tweakers, whose presence was as unwelcome as it was unsettling. These intruders, brandishing a large, menacing knife, began a grotesque display by heating the blade in the fire and then slicing off pieces of their own skin, consuming it with a chilling nonchalance. They forced their poor quality weed on us, despite our protests and having our own. It was a desperate attempt to maintain a semblance of control in a rapidly deteriorating situation. In an effort to distract them, me and another friend resorted to playing snaps, a game that strangely fascinated our uninvited guests, leading them to believe we were practitioners of black magic. Meanwhile, fear and pragmatism prompted us to chain our motorcycles together and remove the spark plugs, a small measure of security against the unpredictable. The night wore on, marked by the sounds of prayers from one friend huddled in his tent, and the sight of another, rifle in hand, quietly aiming through the scope at our unwelcome guests, ready to defend us if needed. One of our group, overwhelmed by the tension, disappeared into the woods, not to return until the early hours of the morning. Amid this chaos, another friend, inebriated to the point of recklessness, 
stumbled and fell face first into the fire, adding injury to the already surreal night. Morning couldn't come soon enough, and with its light, the tweakers vanished, leaving behind a palpable relief, but also an unsettling memory. However, our trials were far from over. Discovering our bikes were out of gas, a few of us left to get fuel, only to return with a park ranger and a tale of sheer absurdity. Their car had exploded. One of them, in a thoughtless act, had been ashing his cigarette on a metal gas can, igniting the fumes and setting his arms ablaze. In panic, they abandoned the car, which was soon engulfed in flames. The ranger, perhaps out of pity or disbelief, reported it as an accidental fire caused by a faulty catalytic converter. As if the trip hadn't been eventful enough, on our way back home, we stopped at a McDonald's, where yet another member of our party caused a scene by indecently exposing himself to a kid and his mother, forcing us to hastily leave. Reflecting on that weekend, it's a story that seems almost too wild to be true, a chaotic blend of danger, foolishness, and the unpredictable nature of life. It was, without a doubt, one of the weirdest trips I've ever been on. Story No. 3 Years have passed, blurring the edges of this memory, yet the core of it remains vivid and chilling. It was one of my early scout camping trips, the location now forgotten, but I distinctly remember a rough neighborhood bordering the far end of the park on the other side of the dense woods. The day had started uneventfully. I was in my tent, nursing a cut from my pocket knife, a small mishap while whittling a stick. The quiet of the afternoon was suddenly shattered by screams and the sounds of frantic running outside. I peered out, my heart racing. A man, drenched in blood, burst out of the woods, a look of sheer terror on his face. He was desperately yelling for help, with another figure ominously chasing him. The man sought refuge in our camp, his arrival throwing our orderly world into chaos. Our leaders quickly sprang into action, herding us kids to the far end of the camp, away from the unfolding horror. I remember being huddled with the other kids, the air thick with fear and confusion. Some of my fellow scouts were crying, while others whispered nervously, trying to make sense of the situation. Despite the chaos around me, my ten-year-old mind was oddly fixated on the cut on my hand, fearing that the leaders might see it and revoke my prized knife card, the strange priorities of a child. The incident ended as mysteriously as it had begun. We never found out what truly happened in the woods that day. As I grew older, the memory would occasionally resurface, prompting me to search online for any news or reports about the incident. But my searches always turned up empty, as if the event had vanished, leaving behind only the echoes of screams and the haunting image of a bloodied man running for his life. Story No. 4 Back when I was a teenager, around 14 or 15, my family had a tradition of camping at a state park. Each night, as part of what my friend and I called the ritual, we would venture into the woods. That particular night, driven by youthful curiosity and a thirst for adventure, we decided to push deeper into the forest than we ever had before. Armed with flashlights, we found thrill in navigating the shadowy terrain with our lights off, relying on the moon's faint glow and our knowledge of the woods. We were about half a mile from the nearest campsite, embraced by the thick, dark silence of the forest, when a faint whispering reached our ears. Startled, we quickly switched on our flashlights, the beams cutting through the darkness. We spun around, hearts pounding, but saw nothing but trees and the night. Shaking off our nerves, we continued walking, dismissing it as just the wind. 
But then, the whispering came again, closer this time. It was unmistakable, and it sent chills down our spines. We stopped, our breaths held in suspense, and scanned the surrounding darkness. That's when we saw her, a figure crawling on the ground, mumbling incoherent words. Her clothes were dark, blending with the night, and she was smeared with dirt. The sight of her, so unexpected and out of place, was deeply unsettling. Upon realizing she had caught our attention, she stood up abruptly and announced that she was searching for her campsite. Despite the eerie encounter, we felt a surge of responsibility to help her. We guided her back to the campground, our minds racing with questions and unease. After a search, we located her group. She was, as it turned out, heavily intoxicated and had wandered off in a confused state while looking for the bathroom. Her friends hadn't even realized she was missing. The thought lingered with us. If we hadn't ventured that far into the woods, she could have been lost all night. That experience, though it ended safely, left an indelible mark on us. It was a stark reminder of how the familiar can turn strange and frightening, and how easily one can find themselves lost and alone in the dark embrace of the woods. Story No. 5 A year had passed since our unnerving encounter in the woods, but the memory of it hadn't faded. In a typical display of youthful bravado, my friends and I decided to return to the same area, convinced that what had happened was just a freak occurrence. This time, however, we thought we'd be clever and avoid any potential nighttime intruders. The plan was simple ditch the tents, and sleep in the beds of our trucks and SUVs. After all, who would suspect a group of kids snoozing in a Toyota Tacoma? The night was deep and still, the kind of quiet that makes every small sound seem amplified. I had drifted into an uneasy sleep in the back of my SUV, my girlfriend beside me, when suddenly a harsh beam of light struck my face. In any other situation, I would have bolted upright, probably hurling a few choice words at the perpetrator. But something in my gut told me to feign sleep, to not let on that I was aware of the presence looming over us. Lying there, my heart pounding, I strained my ears for any sound out of the ordinary. The only thing I could hear over the thumping in my chest was the distant, reassuring sound of a friend snoring by the campfire. The light lingered for what felt like an eternity before finally moving away from my car. I heard the soft crunch of footsteps as the person approached the next truck, shining their light on my unsuspecting friends inside. Risking a glance, I caught a glimpse of the intruder, an older man standing eerily still, his gaze fixated on the sleeping forms of my friends. As soon as he left our campsite, I leapt out of the truck, adrenaline surging through my veins, and woke everyone up. To my horror, many of them had been awake the whole time, silently aware of the stranger's unsettling surveillance. In the light of day, the incident seemed almost unreal, a chilling reminder of our vulnerability in the vast, open wilderness. We left Tucson with a new rule etched in our minds. Never underestimate the unpredictability of camping in the wild, for you never know what, or who, might be watching you as you sleep. Story No. 6 On a camping trip deep in the isolated expanses of Arizona, my friends and I found ourselves in a situation that turned our adventurous spirits into a huddle of fear. It was a night like any other in the wilderness until the tranquility was abruptly shattered. Lying in our tents, the silence of the night was suddenly broken by a soft, yet distinct, sniffing sound just outside the thin fabric of our tent. My first thought was that it must be a bear, or perhaps some other wild animal lured by the scent of our food. Had we, 
in our carelessness, forgotten to secure the garbage? The sniffing continued, methodically moving from our tent to the next. Inside, we all instinctively clutched each other, a silent agreement that we were all awake and acutely aware of the strange presence outside. The tension was palpable, a mix of fear and the absurdity of the situation. Then, in a sudden burst of bravery, or perhaps recklessness, a friend from another tent burst out, screaming and making as much noise as possible. He was armed, believing that the commotion would be enough to scare away whatever wild animal had wandered into our campsite. But it wasn't an animal. To our collective horror, we realized it was a man, a stranger who had rummaged through our coolers and food supplies. Even more unnerving was the realization that he had been sniffing around our tents, an act so bizarre and invasive it sent chills down our spines. Fueled by adrenaline and the urgent need to protect ourselves, our friend chased the intruder off. Without hesitation, we hastily packed up our belongings, our desire for adventure completely eclipsed by the urgent need to leave. The experience left us with a lingering unease and a reminder that sometimes the most frightening creatures in the wilderness walk on two legs. Story No. 7 While roaming through the bush on a serene day, with the intent of hunting upland birds, I decided to take a shortcut through a quiet valley, leading to another area. The day was calm, the kind that hunters cherish, but this tranquility was about to be shattered in a way I could never have imagined. As I walked along the trail, my heart nearly stopped when I came face to face with a man holding an AR-15 in the ready position. An overwhelming sense of danger washed over me, sending the hairs on the back of my neck standing straight up. My instincts screamed that this was not a safe place to be, yet I struggled to maintain my composure. Attempting to diffuse the tension, I called out in the most casual tone I could muster, Hey, just out bird hunting, how are you doing? His response was brief, yet laden with an unsettling pause. Fine, I'm hunting deer. The situation didn't add up. Deer season wasn't open, Arkansas. Fifteen S weren't legal for deer hunting, and his attire was all wrong for a hunter. Instead, he looked more like a person who had been living rough, unkempt, disheveled, and with a certain wildness in his eyes that spoke of hard living. The image of a weathered, fifty-year-old meth addict armed with an AR-15 would have come close to the reality. Seeking a way out, I asked, Do you know the best way for me to go to find some birds? His answer was chilling, his voice sharpening noticeably. Well, I imagine you might find some back the way you came. His message was clear, and I didn't need any further prompting to understand the underlying threat. I didn't stick around to find out whether there was a meth lab or something else just down the trail. I turned and left as quickly as I could without running, every step away from him a relief. The next day, still shaken by the encounter, I reported the incident to the sheriff, though I never heard if anything came of it. The experience haunted me, a stark reminder of the unpredictability and danger that can lurk in the most unexpected of places. Story No. 8 During a long weekend off from school, my friends and I, eager for an adventure, decided to go camping in the remote mountains of North Georgia. We were a group of five two guys and three girls, and we were prepared for a comfortable stay, packing a large ten-person tent and loading up my buddy's truck with all the essentials, including a propane stove, fold-up cots, and even a portable shower. My friend, an army vet, and I were no strangers to the outdoors, so we felt confident and ready for anything. 
we set off on a Wednesday afternoon, parking the truck in a small town before venturing into the woods on foot. The hike was pleasant and uneventful, at least for the first few miles. But as we delved deeper into the wilderness, the atmosphere began to change. Our first encounter with the unknown occurred when we stumbled upon a clearing with a pond. As we stepped into the open, an eerie stillness enveloped us. The birds stopped chirping, the squirrels ceased their scampering, and even the wind seemed to hold its breath. My buddy and I, sensing danger, instinctively drew our handguns, suspecting a predator might be nearby. While scanning the clearing's edge, my friend suddenly grabbed me and gestured across the water. There, at the tree line, about 150 yards away, stood what appeared to be a woman. We assumed she was a local and continued on our way, but when I glanced back, she had vanished. The forest sounds returned as we moved deeper into the trees. We set up camp about two miles past the clearing as night approached. After building a fire and enjoying a few beers, the girl I was interested in, and I sneaked away under the guise of fixing part of the tent. However, our moment of intimacy was cut short when she abruptly stopped, commenting on the sudden, unsettling silence. We returned to the others, who seemed oblivious to anything amiss, and joked about how long it took us to fix the tent. The next morning, we discovered the propane stove had been turned on, but not ignited, emptying overnight. We couldn't recall anyone using it. On the second morning, items started disappearing, a lantern, a sweatshirt. We rationalized it as forgetfulness or misplacement. But during our hike to find a rumored waterfall, the silence enveloped us again. My buddy nudged me, pointing to a hilltop where the same woman was standing, motionless. He made an excuse to the girls about scaring off a mountain lion and went up the hill, only to return and quietly tell me the woman was gone when he got there. After a day at the waterfall, we returned to find our campsite disturbed, likely by animals, we told the girls. That night, however, was when true fear gripped us. My crush woke me up in a panic, and as I looked around, my buddy was already alert. The silence was complete and oppressive. We stayed awake until dawn, then hastily packed up and left. The hike back was unnervingly silent. I occasionally thought I saw the woman among the trees, but never clearly. We avoided the lake area and made it back to the truck in record time. Once we were safely on the road home, everyone started sharing their experiences of seeing or hearing the woman throughout the weekend. Strangely, none of us could clearly recall her face. It was as if our memories of her were blurred. Who she was remains a mystery, but that experience ended my enthusiasm for night hiking and camping. The silence of those woods and the haunting figure of the woman still linger in my mind, a chilling reminder of the unknown that can lurk in the wilderness. Story No Nine Eight years ago, on a crisp fall weekend, my husband, our three young daughters, and I embarked on a group retreat, a tradition we relished annually. That year, buoyed by the success of our company, we opted for a bit of luxury and rented a camper, sidestepping the communal bunkhouses we usually bunked in. The rental agency had a deal, three nights for the price of two, so we planned to return the camper on Monday, despite the retreat concluding on Sunday. The weekend was a blast, the scorching heat making us grateful for the air conditioning in our temporary home. But as Sunday evening approached, a foul smell began to permeate the camper. It turned out the previous renters had neglected to clear the septic lines, and now the stench was unbearable, with waste backing up into the toilet. Concerned about being blamed for the mess, my husband decided to make a late trip to Walmart 
for some Drano. The retreat location, while open year-round, was usually deserted outside organized events. It was owned by a local church and used mainly for their activities. As my husband drove off into the night, I busied myself with tidying the camper, packing our things, and settling the kids for bed. He had been gone for about 40 minutes when I finally curled up in bed with a book, the children finally asleep. It wasn't long before I noticed a strange clicking sound coming from the window behind the bed. My heart raced as I tried to rationalize the noise. Maybe it was just trees scraping the glass. Or a more sinister thought crept in. It could be someone trying to get in. Gripped by fear, I tiptoed to the kitchen, noticing the sound seemed to follow me. As I climbed into the loft above the cab, a chill ran down my spine when I heard the door handle rattle, followed by a scraping noise. Clutching a knife I had grabbed from the kitchen, I crouched protectively over my sleeping children, scanning the cabin to ensure every possible entry point was locked. I frantically tried to get a signal on my cell phone, but to no avail. I was paralyzed with fear, every minute stretching into an eternity, until finally the comforting glow of headlights illuminated the RV site, signaling my husband's return. He dismissed my fears, chalking it up to me being a city girl, and scoffing at the idea of someone trying to break into the camper. Though the night passed without further incident, I couldn't shake off the feeling of dread. The next morning, as we prepared to return the RV, the rental manager noticed something alarming. The gasket around the rear window, near where I had been reading, had been sliced off, likely with a switchblade. There were knife marks on the paint and damage to the window lock. Someone had tried to break into our camper. Thankfully, they hadn't succeeded, and we weren't held responsible for the damage. But that experience left a lasting imprint on me. I vowed never to go camping alone again, always preferring the safety of numbers. The memory of that night still sends shivers down my spine. Story No. 10 On a night when the sky roared with thunder and rain lashed the earth, a group of friends, seeking adventure, ventured into the deep woods for a camping trip. Their curiosity led them to set up their tents near an ancient, forsaken cabin, oblivious to the sinister past it harbored. As darkness enveloped the woods, unnerving sounds began to weave through the trees, a symphony of the unknown that set their nerves on edge. Huddled around the flickering campfire, they tried to dismiss the creeping sensation of unseen eyes watching them from the shadows. Then, without warning, a scream shattered the night, its terror slicing through the storm and lodging deep in their hearts. With trepidation gripping their every step, the friends approached the cabin. Its door creaked open to reveal a chilling scene, walls adorned with strange, unsettling symbols, the air heavy with an ominous energy that seemed almost alive. One by one, the friends started to vanish, disappearing into the void without a trace. Panic surged through those left behind as they frantically sought a way out. The cabin, however, had become a labyrinth, its halls twisting and turning, ensnaring them in a maze with no escape. The air was thick with whispers, voices that echoed their deepest fears and insecurities. Shadows flickered at the edge of their vision, and unseen entities brushed past, leaving a trail of cold dread. It was undeniable. They were not alone in this cursed place. In a final stand, fueled by desperation and terror, the remaining friends rallied their courage. They confronted the darkness, their very souls clashing with the malevolent force that sought to consume them. With every ounce of their being, they fought against the evil that prowled the cabin's haunted halls. As the first light of dawn pierced the darkness, the cabin stood silent, 
its ghastly secrets once again buried in the shadows. The friends emerged, scarred but alive, a silent pact made to lock away the memories of that horrific night. Yet, in the depths of their minds, they knew the terror they had witnessed would forever lurk, a haunting reminder of the night they faced the unimaginable. Story No. 11 A few months back, a friend of mine, a budding nature photographer with a fearless spirit, embarked on a solitary journey into the woods just outside our town. Her mission was simple yet bold, to capture the raw, unfiltered beauty of the wilderness for her growing portfolio. Well versed in the art of solo camping, she ventured confidently into the forest, undeterred by the prospect of solitude. As the sun arched across the sky, she found a quaint clearing, an ideal spot to pitch her tent and immerse herself in the tranquil embrace of nature. The day was spent in harmony with the woods, her camera clicking away, preserving moments of untouched wildness. She exhaustively utilized four rolls of film, documenting the serene and the spectacular. However, the essence of this adventure took a harrowing turn when she later developed the photographs. Amongst the images of verdant trees and wildlife, she discovered four photographs that sent a chill down her spine. They were taken from inside her tent, capturing her in the most vulnerable state imaginable. Asleep, completely oblivious to the presence that loomed in the darkness. These four pictures, starkly contrasting the natural beauty she intended to capture, revealed a disturbing truth. She wasn't alone in the woods that night. An unseen observer had been there, silently intruding her sanctuary, documenting her slumber. The realization that her solitude had been breached, that her moments of unconsciousness had been witnessed and captured by an unknown entity, filled her with an unspeakable dread. The incident left an indelible mark, transforming what was meant to be a journey of artistic pursuit into a haunting memory that lingered long after the photographs were taken. The woods, once a place of peace and inspiration, now echoed with an eerie question. Who was behind the camera, silently watching in the night? Story No. 12 In the heart of the dense woods, there was a hunter who, after a day spent tracking game, found himself engulfed in the vastness of the forest. As dusk set in, he realized he had lost his way amidst the towering trees and the suffocating thicket. With a growing sense of unease, he made the decision to walk in a straight line, hoping to break free from the forest's unyielding grip. Hours seemed to pass, each step heavier than the last, until he stumbled upon a small clearing. In it stood an isolated cabin, a lone sentinel in the sea of green. The sky had turned to an inky black, and with no other shelter in sight, the hunter approached the cabin, its door hanging open as if inviting him in. Exhausted, he collapsed onto the cabin's lone bed, deciding he would offer his apologies and explanations to the owner come morning. As his eyes scanned the cabin's interior, he noticed something unnerving. The walls were lined with portraits, each painted with stunning detail. However, their beauty was overshadowed by something sinister. The figures in the portraits all bore expressions of intense hatred and malice, their eyes seemingly fixed on him with a disturbing intensity. Feeling a chill crawl up his spine, the hunter tried to dismiss the unsettling feeling, telling himself it was just his imagination. He turned his back to the hateful gazes, and, despite his discomfort, eventually succumbed to a fitful sleep. The light of dawn woke him the next morning. He opened his eyes, blinking in the unexpected brightness. As he looked up, a cold wave of realization washed over him. The cabin had no portraits. 
the walls were adorned with windows, and through each one the morning light revealed the truth. He had been watched, not by painted figures, but by real, living eyes from the forest outside. Story No. 13 Back in 2010, a young boy named George, just 14 years old, set out for a summer camp located in the mountains, far from his hometown. The camp was near his grandparents' house, so he spent a few days with them before the camp started. His grandfather had arranged with the camp organizer to pick George up midway, at a designated spot. They drove there, but upon arrival, they found no sign of the bus. After waiting for a while, they decided to drive George to the campsite themselves. As evening fell, they reached the campsite. George's grandfather was upset that the organizer hadn't picked George up as planned, but the organizer remained silent. After his grandfather left, George began to explore the campsite and noticed his name on a tent. He put his belongings inside and saw his friends gathered around a fire in a circle, staring at him strangely, which he found unsettling. Soon, one of the boys stood up, glaring at George with anger. He picked up a large stone and threw it at George, and then, one by one, the other children started pelting George with stones. In desperation, George called for the camp organizer, but there was no response. He ran to his tent and hid inside. After a while, the noises outside stopped, as if nobody had been there at all. It was now night, and George stepped out to see a girl digging a hole. He asked her who she was and what she was doing. She turned to him with a terrifying expression and said she was digging George's grave. Terrified, George decided to call his grandfather to come and take him back home. He went to the camp organizer's tent, but it was empty. Suddenly, someone pushed him from behind. He turned to see not only the camp organizer, but also his classmates, all looking horrifying, some with burnt bodies, others with broken bones, each holding a dagger. George closed his eyes in fear, but then someone took his hands from his eyes. It was his grandfather, who silently led him to the car and quickly drove away. George was silent and shaken during the drive. Once they were about 70 to 80 kilometers from the campsite, his grandfather stopped the car and asked George what had happened. After George recounted the events, his grandfather revealed a chilling piece of information. On his way back after dropping George off, he received a call from the summer camp team, informing him of a tragic accident. The bus carrying the camp organizer and the 24 children had crashed and everyone on board had died. Hearing this, George's grandfather immediately turned around to fetch him. The experience deeply traumatized George and he never attended another summer camp again.